Amen. Please turn now to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, and we will read verses 22 through 26. Today's sermon is on the regulative worship and the centrality of Christ. They're in regulative worship and the centrality of Christ. Read along with me in Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 22. And the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the people of Israel, You have seen for yourself that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourself gods of gold. An altar of earth you shall make for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. If you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build on it of hewn stones, for if you wield your tool on it, you profane it. And you shall not go up the steps of my altar, that your nakedness be not exposed on it. Now there is a great contrast of what has been called worship of God throughout human history. During the Protestant Reformation, churches took two different perspectives during that time. They all agreed, the Protestants did, that they should flee from the idolatry that existed within the Roman Catholic religion of worship. But what you find is, you see this many times in history, it's much easier to declare what is wrong or what you should not do than it is to declare what it is that you should do. And that's the situation that the Protestants ended up during the Protestant Reformation. The Lutherans, and later on, some of the Anglicans, held to what is known as normative worship. Now, normative worship allowed anything that is not directly forbidden in the Scriptures to be practiced in a worship service. Now, the Reformed took a different perspective. The Reformed took a stance which is known as the regulative principle of worship, and it states that you may only do within a worship service that which the scriptures permit you to do. And that was of no small controversy during this time, and I'm not going to go into the history of that because we're actually walking through that right now in Sunday school. So I encourage you to come to Sunday school and also to listen to some of the lectures that we've covered so far. John Calvin declared that the regulative principle of worship was one of the major focuses of the Reformation. He claimed that there were two main pillars of the Reformation. One was a right understanding of God and of God's salvation. And the second was a right understanding of how we are to worship God. So a right understanding of salvation was one pillar. And the other pillar was um, a right understanding of how we are to worship God. Now these are two of the greatest errors that exist within Roman Catholicism. In both of these, mind this, both of these flow out of a, a, ba- a poor understanding of the word of God. See, the the Roman Catholics don't accept the scriptures to be sufficient for either salvation or worship. And that's, that's a proposition that I'm making here. The Roman Catholics don't accept either one to be sufficient within the scriptures, either the view of salvation or of worship. See, with the right understanding of the word of God, now that is a belief that the scriptures are sufficient for a right understanding of worship of God and of salvation, with that right understanding, then it's going to change how you worship God. It's going to change how you approach God. So the question here is, who is it that gets to determine what is worship? Who makes that determination? Because ultimately, the decision is being made somewhere. Let's look back at the first account of worship in the Bible. That's in Genesis 4. It's in Genesis 4, and it's going to be verses 2 through 5. And it says, Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. 
But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. See, both of them within that passage appeared to believe that their form of worship was acceptable. That's why they brought it forward. See, it doesn't appear that the Lord's charge, that the reason why the Lord didn't accept Cain's offering was either on account of his a poor intent or a poor desire that exists within them. He had an intent of worshiping God within what he did, and he had a desire from what we can read within the scriptures there to worship God. They both had an offering there within the passage that they believed was acceptable to the Lord. But notice this. The problem lied first and foremost within the content of the offering that they gave to the Lord. The worship of Cain wasn't made right because he thought it was going to be acceptable to God. The worship of Cain wasn't made right because he had really good intentions within his heart. No, acceptable worship is made acceptable because God has declared it to be acceptable. It is God. It is God that determines that which is worship and that which is not worship. So there's four main points that I want to bring out from this text. Number one is this. Our worship of God has its authority within the word of God. It is God's word alone whereby we can know what God requires and what God allows for worship. It's God's word. It's not our culture. It's not our life experiences, and it's not even our desires or our intents that determine what is or is not worship. Number two, our worship of God requires us to flee from idolatry. Idolatry is never allowed in the worship of God. This normally isn't controversial with Protestants, but there are times in which it comes in. Number three, Our worship of God does not allow for man's additions or creativity. It does not allow for man's additions or creativity to the elements within worship. We don't get to define what is worship. We don't get to determine what it is that God finds acceptable. And that which God finds acceptable doesn't then become acceptable to God because we desire it to be or because we really want it to be. And number four, number four, our worship of God within the New Testament foreshadows the worship that we will have in heaven for all of eternity. There is a great picture that we have within New Testament worship, and it points to the worship that we will uh, participate in and experience for all of eternity. So number one, our worship of God has its authority in the word of God. We see that in verse 22. Where it says, And the Lord says to Moses, Thus you shall say to the people of Israel, You have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. Our worship of God has its basis in the word of God. The Lord uh, has Moses direct the people back to what he said. What the Lord spoke to them as what is proper worship. And therefore he declares that their basis for worship lies within the word of God. The authority of the word of God has its authority because it is that which the Lord has said. That's what makes it authoritative. We see that in 2 Timothy, in the famous passage, 2 Timothy three sixteen through 17, where it says, All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may com- be complete, equipped for every good work. So just as the Israelites had the word of God that directed them in their worship of God, so do we as the New Testament church have the word of God which should direct us within our worship. So it's not enough. So here's here's what can happen. There can be a confusion. There's a confusion there that exists because someone will see the rules within the Old Testament and then see that perhaps we don't have the same rules here and then act as though there are no parameters whereby we have to worship. But it's not as though the Son of God came down from heaven, lived as a man, died as a propitiation 
for our sins and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And that he did all of this so that now, within this time period, you can worship him within your own imaginations and how, from whatever way that you determine to be correct. See, I believe that one of the ways in which we come to this faulty understanding, a way in which we come to this wrong view of worship, is that sometimes we think that we're doing God a favor by coming to church. That somehow we have walked in here and we've now checked off a box. So instead of approaching the worship of God in reverence and with awe, we're rather just approaching it as though a box that needs to be checked so that we get some kind of a credit. And what it does is it leads us to great casualness in how we're approaching the Lord in worship. So let's walk through what are some of the ways in which we have been commanded in the New Testament to worship God. The first is that we are commanded to gather together. We see this in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25, where it says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So we are commanded in Scripture to draw together, draw, um, to assemble together. That's why we're not permitted to forsake the assembly of believers. We are commanded in Scripture to preach the Word of God in the assembly. We see that in 2 Timothy 4.2, where Paul writes, Preach the Word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And it's very important. A minister preaching the Word of God, if he is rightly exegeting the Word of God, if he is communicating that which the Word of God actually said, it is as though God is speaking that to you at that time. Don't take that too far. I'm not taking that. I'm not telling you at any time to take what I say and not take it into account in what the Word of God says. If you are saying that which the Word of God says, that is the Word of God speaking at that time. That's what makes the Word of God so powerful. It has to be what the Word of God says. Next, singing and thanksgiving. We see this in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Next, we are commanded to read the word and to teach. We see that in 1 Timothy 4.13-14, through 14, where Paul writes, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. Next, we are commanded to pray. We see Christ speak of this in Matthew 21, 13. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But he he condemns them at that time where he says, you have made it a den of robbers. Next, we are called to participate in the Lord's Supper. That's 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, where Paul writes, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup, is the the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this bread, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Next, we are commanded to participate in baptism. We see that in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. These are the things that the Lord requires for worship. Now, we have no authority to either take away from them within the worship of the New Testament or to go on and to add to them. For that which the Lord has not declared to be worship, we cannot declare that this is worship. It doesn't become worship just because we say that it is worship. Our preferences, our desires, our uh, hobbies, none of those are a basis of what is declared Worship, because what happens is when we do that, we're not really worshiping. So if I decide now to put on a skit in the middle of the service or to have a puppet show, it's not worship. 
There's times in your life where you can do a skit. You can have a drama. There's times in life where you can have a puppet show or even go on to have a concert. These are not things that are sinful in and of themselves. But don't call it a worship service to have those things in it because you have no basis in Scripture for that definition. And if it doesn't have that basis in the Word of God as its definition, what's happening here, it's merely just being left up to the whims and the desires of men. And if that's the plumb line, if the plumb line of worship is merely that which man desires, merely that which man deems to be worship, then it's man who is designing, it's man who is defining that which is worship. And what is sinful man going to do? Sinful man is going to design and define worship that is made after the likeness of sinful man and not after the likeness of God. Dear friends, our worship must be defined by the Word of God and directed to God with Christ as its central focus. It is upon this that we have our basis for our entire worship service here at Grace Family Baptist Church. So first, our view of worship needs to come from and have its authority within the Word of God. And next, see that the worship of God calls us, within the Word, it calls us to flee from idolatry. That's Exodus 20, 23, where he says, You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourself gods of gold. Now, missionaries in areas such as India have to be very, very careful in the ways that they preach the gospel to people that are over there. Because it is quite possible at times to go into certain parts of the world where, where you have um, uh, polytheistic religions and to preach the gospel there and to have many people come forward, and trust in Christ, and declare that, that, that Christ is their Savior. See, but then if you just quickly put away your movie screen and put away your Jesus video and just go on to the next city, you may think that you have numerous, numerous converts at this place. But if you stay in such a place, you will find at times that you have people that just merely took Jesus and stuck him on the shelf with all of their other gods, just basically like, you know, well, we'll see if this one will do the trick too. See, Jesus wasn't the way, the truth, and the life to that person. Jesus was just another way. Jesus was another truth. Scripture forbids such a profession um, from a person. It forbids us also from taking idolatrous worship, from taking idolatrous practices from other religions and using them for the purpose of worshiping God. This points directly to the second commandment, which was repeated there where it says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast and love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." The second commandment speaks against adding paganism to the worship of God. We are not to take um, worship that would have been given to a false god and then bring it into or integrate it into the worship of a true god. The Westminster Shorter Catechism states this in question 96. It says, what does God require in the second commandment? And it says that we in no wise represent God by images nor worship him in any other way than that he has commanded us within his word. So we are forbidden from taking any pagan practices and bringing them into and introducing them to the worship of God. Think on this. Where is it that the Israelites learned the idea of making gods of gold and silver? Where did they get this idea of the golden calf that we will see in about 15 chapters from here? Was that something they learned from the Lord? Is that something Moses taught them? No. No, it wasn't. It was something that they had brought with them out of Egypt. They exported these, these pagan practices with them and sought to integrate them into the worship of the true God. Why is it that men seek idolatrous worship? What is the reason? 
It is that they are not seeking God. It's a very simple answer. You seek after these, these idolatrous practices because that is what you desire. Why is it that the Jews sought to follow Jehovah in ways in which they worship gods in Egypt? Dear friends, it was because they desired Egypt. Pay attention to this. I think we miss this sometimes. I know I did until I looked back over this passage. Aaron called the celebration uh, of the golden calf the feast of Jehovah. This is Exodus 32, verses 3 through 5, where it says, So all the people took off the gold rings that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, and they received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with a graven tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be the feast to the Lord. That is the word Yahweh there. He took that and integrated it into this Egyptian pagan practice. He's not worshiping, he was, well, he was worshiping the gods of Egypt, but he wasn't worshiping them in the same way there. What he's doing here is he's claiming to be worshiping the true God. He's claiming to be worshiping the God that brought him out of Egypt, out of slavery, but he's practicing and worshiping that God in the same way in which they were worshiping gods within Egypt. We are forbidden from worshiping God in pagan ways or in any way introducing those pagan ways into uh, that, which, that which we do within our service. This is something that's confirmed within the Second London Confession of Faith where it says the religious worship is to be given to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to him alone, not angels, saints, or any creatures, and since the fall, not without a mediator, nor in the mediation of any other than Christ alone. Now, this has been an area that has been historically violated by the Roman Catholic Church. They would begin to pray to angels or to deceased saints. Friends, when you do this, you begin to pray to angels You begin to practice the people who are deceased. You're not practicing Christianity. When you do that, what you're doing is you're practicing paganism. And that's what happened within the church. People brought with them their various forms of pagan religion and integrated them into uh, Christian worship. So we're we're forbidden from introducing pagan worship practices into our worship of the true God. But here we're also, and this is point three, we're forbidden from adding to worship anything from our own desires or our own creativity. And that's talking about the elements of worship. It's here that we're going to spend most of our time today because this is an area in which we are going to be most tempted to violate this, which is known as the regulative principle of worship. We see this in Exodus 20, 25. And he says this, If you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build of it hewn stones. For if you wield a tool on it, you profane it. The Lord commanded them here not to build on an altar of hewn stones. They were not to work upon the altar and in working upon the altar to make the altar to be in some way something that is better. Because that's kind of what you're saying here. You're saying this altar here is not good enough in in its present form. I'm going to take my tool. I'm going to build upon it. I'm going to bring my artistry into this. And I'm going to make this altar better than it was previously. See, in doing that, what you're saying is you can make the sacrifice more acceptable. You can make it more pleasing to God by adding your own creativity and your own ingenuity. And here's why this is wrong. This is wrong because it takes away from that to which the sacrifice is pointed. These sacrifices during this time pointed to Christ. What does it say about the sacrifice that I'm giving here if I can add to this sacrifice here by my own ingenuity, if I can add to this sacrifice by my own efforts and my own creativity. See, what does it say for Christ Jesus, our perfect sacrifice, if it, it requires me to add to it some, something special in order to make it more perfect and more appropriate? See, it does not point out that to which the sacrifice is pointing when I, when I am acting as though, I'm, this is in the Old Testament context, when you're acting as though I need to do something to make this more acceptable, that to which it's pointing to is Christ Jesus. You're not pointing rightly to Christ, one who is the perfect sacrifice, who needs nothing added to him. 
No, they were given, they were not given the priority to add to this altar or their sacrifice their own ingenuity because there is nothing that we add to Christ in his sacrifice that makes his sacrifice more appropriate. God doesn't need you for anything. There is nothing that God needs you for. The belief that God needs you is a road that paves the way to idolatry. The belief that God needs you is the road is a road that is paved to idolatry. God doesn't need us for anything. See, we we have the tables turned here when we have this belief. When we have a belief that God in some way needs us for something, what we're saying here is that we're what we're doing here is we're making a God in our image instead of worshiping uh, the God who made us in his image. This is a mistake that David made. David sought to build a temple for the Lord. He said that he would build a temple for the Lord, but the Lord never asked him to build him a temple. The Lord reminded him of this. When? When did the Lord ask David to build a temple? When was it that he told him that this is something that he should do? This is something that David had determined that he should do for the Lord, but the Lord never commanded him to do this. And the fact that he desired to do this didn't become right, didn't become worshipful, merely because David had good intentions. It didn't become right and worshipful merely because David really, really wanted to do this for the Lord. Who is it that determines what is allowed? Is it God or is it man? I see a similarity between the regulative principle and the teaching of limited atonement. I see a similarity here. Many times someone will say, I don't agree with limited atonement. Now, limited atonement is the belief that the blood of Christ um, atones for a particular people, that there are a particular people whereby that are atoned by the blood of Christ. And someone will come from an Arminian viewpoint and they will say, you know what, I don't agree with this idea from limited atonement because I could believe the blood of Christ can save all men. Now, I'm not going to go down the path here to make an apologetic for that, but just let that stand. But they'll say, I don't agree with limited atonement. But you see, such a person will not be a universalist. Such a person that makes that argument will not say, everyone goes to heaven no matter what, and the blood of Christ forgave everyone's sin no matter what, so everyone goes to heaven regardless of where their faith is. They won't say that. Now, will they? See, so they do end up believing that there is some kind of a limit to the atonement. They believe there is a limit to where the atonement is actually applied. But as opposed to what the Calvinist says, that the atonement is limited by God's eternal decree, they would say that the atonement, now they wouldn't say this, but this is the logical outworking of the belief, the logical outworking of the belief is that the atonement is thereby limited by the decision of man. The man makes the decision, and that decision is what limits the atonement. So you, in the end, end up believing in a form of limited atonement. Take that over to the regulative principle. Someone will say, I don't believe in the regulative principle. I believe that we should be allowed to worship God as we believe, as we should. But such a person will then limit what is worshipful. And you will see people do that. You could say, okay, well, maybe we should do a circus in the middle of church. That's not forbidden in Scripture. And the person, well, I don't think we should do a circus. But why? What is your basis for having that belief? So we stand and we hold to what's known as the regulative principle of worship because we believe that God has regulated that which should be worshipful. Whereas if you don't hold to this, you end up believing in some type of a regulative principle, but instead of God being the one that has determined that which is regulated and defined as worship, you're saying that man should be the one who is regulated and defined that which should be worshipped. So you still end up having a form of the regulative principle. You just have the tables turned on who should be, termi- who should be determining that which is worship and that which is not worship. I want you to see this too, an aspect to this. This is one of the major problems. When you begin to introduce something extra, you take away from that which has been prescribed. When you take away, when you you introduce something extra, you take away from that which has been prescribed. The main problem with violating the regular principle of worship is that when 
you begin to add something else, you're stealing the emphasis, you're stealing the focus off of that which God has uh, prescribed, that which God has regulated. I want you to think of it as this way. Suppose I went on a date with my wife, and I was sitting there on the date, and I did everything. If you went down the checklist, I did everything I was supposed to do, okay? I made the plans. I got someone to watch the kids. Um, we're at a place that she likes. We've got the food. We've had our conversation. We've, I've done all the little checklists of husband things, right? But then, throughout the time, I'm going to be sitting here checking the scores on the Texans games and seeing how it is and maybe even watching little video clips. I don't mean maybe just for 30 seconds or checking stuff. I mean throughout the time. And I want you to think upon this. Would that not be offensive to my wife during this time? And I could say, well, look, I've done all the stuff I'm supposed to do. My my wife, uh, the kids are taken care of. I've taken you here. You like this place. You've got your food. You know, we got the money to pay for this. All the things are there that you, that, that, that are required for this to be a date. This counts as a date. Check. It's a date. But then what's happening there is I'm introducing things into the date that are distracting from the purpose of the date. And what's the purpose of the date? The purpose of the date is for my wife and I to hang out with one another. But rather what's happening here is my focus, my desire, and everything that's happening at that point is going towards the football game or the baseball game or, you know, some video I saw on YouTube. So here's the same thing there. If the Israelites are putting greater focus into the altars, there's going to be less focus upon the ceremony of the sacrifice that is happening there. Um, They would have greater opportunity there. What they're doing is they're putting more focus upon themselves. So instead of having a greater focus on God, they're having a greater focus on themselves in what they have done. So we are not to bring the worship of God. They were not to bring the worship of God um, into it, their own creativity, into the worship Here's a, here's a famous example. This is in Leviticus 10, 1 through 3. And this is a famous example of a Nadad and Abihu. These are the sons of Aaron who first served as, as priests. And it says, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took a censer and put fire in it and laid the incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came down, came out from heaven before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Notice here, they weren't accused of worshiping an idol. They were accused here of strange fire. Nadab and Abihu offered something that was not prescribed by the Lord. We don't know exactly what this means by strange fire, but it is certain that in some way they had added something to the worship of God, which the Lord had not prescribed. Why does this happen? Well, it's very reasonable that they believed that they could make the worship of God better by adding that which had not been commanded. They thought they could improve upon this worship in some way. It's possible it was something that was forbidden, but there's no evidence here that this was something that was forbidden. The focus of the text seems to be that they were just adding something that was not commanded. But check this. If I have to go to my own imagination to determine that which is worshipful to God then I cannot rightly claim that I hold to the, the sola of the Reformation, which is sola scriptura. That's not sola scriptura. That's me adding to scripture. And rather, if that's the idea, then I need to be going around to all these different churches and finding out all the different ways in which they are worshiping God so I can keep adding to this and come up with a greater and greater and greater way to worship God. The confession affirms the regular principle of worship in chapter 22 of the, on religious worship and the Sabbath day. It says, The light of nature shows that there is a God who hath lordship and sovereignty over all, is just, good, and doth good unto all, and is therefore to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted in, and served with 
with all the heart and with all the soul and with all the might, but the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshiped according to the imagination and devices of men, nor the suggestions of Satan under any visible representations or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scriptures." One of the slippery slopes that we end up going around, though, is that we justify normative worship because we have a wrong view of evangelism. We'll justify normative worship because we have a faulty view of evangelism. And that's my, 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 my guard here, my fence here. Don't use normative worship as evangelism. This is a common argument that is given, and it's given, it'll say, look, what you're saying here makes sense, it's very focused on the Word of God, but you're missing out on a great evangelistic opportunity by not bringing in these other avenues and these other ways in which you could have people worshiping God. Now look, I'll grant this, it makes logical sense, right? Let's follow through the logic. Worldly people are interested in worldly things, therefore, we need to use that which, is, um, which they are interested in, to draw them in. Then once we've drawn them in, we'll have an opportunity to share the gospel with them. Okay? Now don't, don't make a sound bite on me with that. But this is a practice that is very common within our country. And this has led many churches, and I'm not being sarcastic, this is true. This has led some churches to go so far as to have rodeo-themed church services. They'll have all out, the dirt, the fences, the cowboys riding bulls, and every so often they'll stop, maybe sing a praise song, and then go back to the next part of the rodeo. This is on a Sunday morning, by the way. Uh, then, of course, they'll stop at some point. The pastor will give an encouraging word. Others have gone so far as to have dirt bike races, or they'll have services that are themed after a major motion picture. Uh, one of the ways that's more popular ways that's been given during worship services is to have some type of a uh, dance theme during it where they perform a popular pop song. And all of this is done in the name of the Great Commission. Now let's review what the Great Commission states. It says, And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now friends, you can't get dirt bikes and rodeos from a passage such as this. He says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. Now listen, if I need to bring the things of the world into the church so that I can get the people of the world into the church, what boundaries do I have? What's the ending point for this? Am I really bringing people into the church? Am I really bringing people into the fold if that to which I am drawing them to, is not Christ. That which you use to draw people into the fold is that which you will use to keep them there. So if you're going to bring them in with all these games and all this foolishness, that is how you're going to have to operate your church to keep such people there because it is that that they really desire. It is that that they were seeking after and it is that for which they are there and why they're attending. Here's the other problem with that. It is, it is also bad because it assumes that a worldly-minded person can be tricked into accepting the things of God. It thinks that in somehow you can do some kind of a trick here, and then, you know, I'm going to throw Jesus up now after the dirt bike race, and then you're going to, oh, okay, I see where we are. Paul says the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. It's in 1 Corinthians 2.14. He says, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Oh, so here's the charge that would come at this point. So you're saying the worship service shouldn't have any evangelism. No, I'm not saying that. That's foolishness. And by the way, adding to the regular principle has no basis in Scripture as a form of evangelism. Adding to the regulative principle, adding to that which is regulated in Scripture as worship, has no basis in the Scriptures 
as a form of evangelism. So if you want evangelism in your church service, preach the gospel. Preach the gospel in your worship service. Everyone needs to hear the gospel. Everyone needs to be reminded of the gospel, both Christians and non-Christians. Everyone needs to hear the gospel. But check this. Here's the other problem. By copying the things of the world, you're also just a cheap imitation of that which you're copying. By copying things of the world to draw people of the world into the church to, to, to see your copy of these things in the world, you end up being a very cheap imitation of that to which you're copying. I wish sometimes we would just look ourselves in the mirror. Don't think the world doesn't recognize this. Don't think the world doesn't see how we are trying to copy them in these lame fashions. When you seek to copy the world in order to bring others into the congregation um, and then to bring them the cross, what you end up doing is a halfway job of both. You end up having less focus on instruction and the word of God. You end up having less focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have less focus on evangelism. And then you have a very lame version of that to which you're actually trying to copy. So you, you're not doing a good job at anything. You try to copy a rodeo. You try to copy dirt bike races. You try to have a Star Wars themed service. Back to the future. These are all real things that have happened. Um, or any other worldly aspects, you end up just being, well, a really lame rodeo. You end up being a really lame dirt bike race. You end up being a very lame copy of this motion picture. So here's this. Here's another charge. Am I saying in the regular principle of worship that you are required to live and to act in all the ways in which the people in the Bible lived and acted? This is the charge and how it would come forward. You're saying, oh, so what you're saying here in the regular, regulative principle is that all of us need to meet in houses because in the New Testament they met in houses. And you're saying we need to wear robes too because in the New Testament they wore robes and in the Old Testament too. I guess that means we can't have air conditioning either. I have had this conversation with numerous people. I don't know why air conditioning always comes up. Like, I guess we've got to turn off the air conditioner. I guess that's really to get someone in Texas scared of the regulative principle that we're going to turn off the air conditioning in August. See, but they, this air is made because you fail to see what is known as elements of worship and circumstances of worship. Okay, so the elements of worship are the things I mentioned earlier. Singing, praying, preaching, uh, the, the Lord's Supper. Those are elements. And then you have what's known as circumstances of worship. And that would be, uh, well, that would be what you're wearing. That would be where you meet. That could even be the language that you speak. So look here in the text. I believe we even see circumstances of worship during this tabernacle time. This is in verse 24. He says, In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. The worship of God during this tabernacle time was one where they were moving from one place to another. This is what we call in theology as a matter of circumstance. It wasn't an element of their worship. It wasn't something they were prescribed to do within their worship. It was a matter of circumstance in where they are at that time. So the same thing is true in the church. You can have a worship service in many different languages. You can have a worship services in many different places. You could be meeting in a building. You could be meeting in a hut. You could be singing a cappella. You could be using instruments. Um, even so far as, even so far as, everyone doesn't even have to have their own copy of the Bible. Praise God that we do. But that's not even required uh, as a regulative principle. Um, these are not elements of the worship service. So our call here is to recognize that God is the author of our worship. It is our Lord God that is the author of our worship. God has so determined uh, that which is true worship. What is our standard of worship? That which the Lord has declared. And the Lord has the authority to declare that which is worship and that which is not worship. Think of the sacrifice that Cain made. It was the Lord's prerogative to determine that one was acceptable and that one was not. All right, Cain may have had very good intentions, as we said. He very well could have given a sacrifice with all of his heart. He really, really, really could have meant it and really, really desired it. It didn't matter. He was giving a sacrifice 
that was not pleasing to the Lord. And it didn't go from a category of being pleasing to not pleasing merely on the basis of what Cain wanted it to be. Desire in doing something doesn't make it more beautiful to God. Your best intentions don't have the ability to make your actions holy. One of the best examples of this is in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1-7. through 7. It says, David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is on a hill, to Uzzah of Io, the sons of Abinadab were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Io went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and uh, cassinets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen had stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God struck him down there because of his error, and he died beside the ark of the Lord. Uzziah uh, had great intentions in the actions that he did before the ark of the Lord. His, the desire in and of itself wasn't a bad desire. I would say the desire was a noble one. He sought to protect the ark from plummeting to the ground. Think of the filth of the roads at this time, these roads in which animals walked upon, because animals were the main way of transportation. They were filthy. They were disgusting. You can see his thoughts at this time. He saw the filth of the road and he desired to protect the ark of God from falling into this area. But what did he miss? He missed his own filthiness there, didn't he? He overlooked his own sinfulness. And his own filthiness and sinfulness was far greater than anything that you would find lying upon that road. His intentions did not make his actions righteous. His intentions did not make his actions righteous. We are not called to make any additions to the Lord's worship, either from our own culture or from our own imaginations. Because, remember friends, the Lord does not need our help. He's not seeking after our ingenuity and our creativity. He doesn't need those things. The Lord is omniscient. The Lord is omnipotent. He does whatever he wants. And this is where I want to end the point. Is, this is the end of this point, is that we don't have any room for additions in our worship service. That's my opinion. I think we're still working through that which the Lord has called us to do. Honestly, when you rightly worship the Lord in the ways in which he has called you to worship him within a service, in the ways in which he has called you to worship him in word and in thought and in deed, dear friends, have we perfected that? How often are our thoughts pulled to the cares upon the world or to thoughts of other things during the time of a worship service? Look through all the elements of worship that you go through. If you focus upon that is which that which has been prescribed, you have plenty for the worship service. So fourthly, our worship of God uh, in the New Testament. The worship within the tabernacle time here symbolizes the worship of that we have here within the church. It is simple. It is not extravagant. It is something that can be done wherever they stop. Why is that? Because the Lord is with them wherever they go. Wherever they go throughout this wilderness journey, the presence of the Lord is with them. They don't have to travel somewhere to go and to meet the Lord because the Lord is present with them wherever they are during this wilderness journey. The same is true in Christianity. That is why we have no holy places in Christianity. You, you can't go on a Christian pilgrimage. Most other religions in the world have pilgrimages. Christianity does not have a pilgrimage. There is no holy place in Christianity. Why is that? Because God is omnipresent. And therefore, it is unnecessary to travel from one place to another place to have a greater manifestation of God that I wouldn't have had over here because I wasn't over here. He is everywhere. 
Jesus speaks of this time in John chapter 4, and he talks of a time uh, when you, people will worship him in spirit and truth. He says to the woman at the well in John four twenty one through 24, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You will worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Jesus speaks of this time. The confession also acknowledges this. It says, Neither prayer nor any other part of religious worship is now, now under the gospel tied unto or is made more acceptable by any place in which it is performed or towards which it is directed. But God is to be worshipped everywhere in spirit and in truth, as in private families daily and in secret, uh, each one by himself, so more solemnly in public assemblies, which are not carelessly nor willing, uh, willfully to be neglected or forsaken when God by his word or in providence calleth thereunto. So the question often asks, well, I can just... Worship God in the golf course then, can't I? Because it doesn't matter if I'm in the church service or I'm on the golf course. The truth is you certainly can worship God on the golf courses. There are churches that have met in the clubhouses of golf courses because some of them are closed on Sundays. Um, If you walk out on Sunday morning with your golf clubs to the golf course, you're not there to worship God, are you, right? You are there to play golf. I think that's a pretty simple answer. But this is the beauty of this worship that we have now. And this is why we need to find this regulative view of worship beautiful. The New Testament worship um, points to and is a foretaste of the worship in heaven. It points to and it is a foretaste of the worship that is that will be in heaven. So just as the Old Testament worship pointed to the necessity of the coming Messiah who would come, all right, it was not the Messiah, but it pointed to the great and glorious worship. Uh, it pointed to the great Messiah who would come and the necessity thereof. Um, the worship that we have within the New Testament church points to that great and glorious eternal worship that we will have on the new heavens and the new earth. The worship in heaven will be completely God-centered, the worship in heaven will be completely centered around God. And your friends, this should be a cause for concern for those who find regulative worship to be something that is boring. Or suppose you find regulative worship to be something that is inadequate, something that is lacking in what you need in order to worship God. Do you know how the scriptures divine, uh, define heavenly worship? They describe them in these particular ways. So that which is prescribed, we are prescribed to do in the scriptures in the New Testament, foreshadows that beautiful worship that we will have in heaven. J.C. Ryle wrote a famous track, and it's called, Suppose an Unholy Man Went to Heaven. I encourage you to go on the internet and, and to read through it, but I'll give a, just a short summary of it. But he walks through this idea of someone who has worldly desires Worldly thoughts, spins their days after worldly things, but then believes that he would go to heaven. And he walks him through this. He says, but sir, do you desire the word of God to be read? It's not something you do. It's not something you desire. Do you desire the preaching of the word of God, the proclaiming thereof? Do you desire prayer? Do you desire singing? And as he walks through all these, he says, you don't desire any of these things, but yet you Expect to be someone who will be in heaven, a place where God will be praised, a place where the word of God will be proclaimed. And he basically ends up saying that which you think you would go to is something you would probably find to be quite boring. What does it say for us? What does it say for us spiritually if that which is a foreshadow of that which will be done eternally is something that we find to be inadequate? Something that we find to be, oh, this is, not, this is not good enough. I need something more than this. If during times of worship our minds are rather wandering um, upon that which is not of the Lord and that which is the Lord has not drawn us towards as worship, that should be a time for us to put a check upon ourselves. 
to put a check upon our heart. Friends, the Levites could have worked to make the ceremonial law more attractive to those who were not a part of the covenant. There's things they could have done to draw the Canaanites in or to draw other people in to make it, if I could use a more modern word, to make it more relevant to them. They could have made the work less burdensome. They could have made the work that they do less messy. They could have found ways to make it perhaps more interesting. See, but in doing that, they would have won. They would have violated the law of God. And then in doing so, um, they would have been pointing to themselves. They would have been pointing to worldly things instead of pointing to the Messiah who was to come. See, we too could do this. We could seek to make a church service to be more attractive to the world by adding worldly elements to a church service. But in the process, what we're doing is we're doing a disservice to the world and we're doing a disservice to the church. See, we, we give them both what, we need, what they need. We, we give them both what they do not need when we give them less of what is most necessary. See, what we're doing there, if, if, we, if we give the world more of the world, we're giving the world that which... They do not need. We're giving the church that which they do not need. But if it is Christ that we're proclaiming, and if it is Christ to which our service is focusing, we are giving the church that which they need, and we're giving to the world that which they need. May Christ be the center of our worship. May Christ be the center of our focus within our worship, not our imaginations, not the desires of our flesh, not worldly things. May we be, um, may God's worship, may we worship God in spirit and in truth, conforming ourselves to the word of God rather than conforming the word of God to the world. I want to close with a passage from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, where it says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and let us offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe, For our God is a consuming fire. Let us offer acceptable worship to the Lord with reverence and awe. Because in doing that, we glorify God. We glorify God by making Christ the center of worship. Making Christ the center of worship instead of ourselves as the center of worship. And in doing that, we're doing that which we were called to do. We're doing that which we were made, we were created to do. And that is to worship God and enjoy him forever. May that be our desire. Let's go to the Lord.